Heavenly Father, as we begin part two of this subject, we ask that once again your Holy Spirit would guide and direct in our considerations. We want to understand this subject in a, a way that we can intelligently understand it as well as share it with those around us in a winning way. We want to, we want to understand it as it relates to the end of the world, and we ask that your Holy Spirit and angels would enlighten us uh, with these truths at this time in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> in our last presentation, we, we dealt just briefly with uh, some of the history of the daily in Adventism, and we want to now take a look at um, the, just a pioneer logic of what the daily was. And um, you'll notice in your notes, you got, we're going to deal with Sermon 2 here, but if you thumb back to page 17, you'll find an appendix to Sermon 2. And this appendix is an article that was pr pr printed in the Review and Herald magazine, January 28th, 1858. And uh, the editors of the Review and Herald in this article selected from different pioneers such as William Miller, Apollos Hell, Josiah Litch, and put together the understanding of the daily as of 1858. And it's a very good article that you'll, you'll have in your possession now. But we want to go through and just set forth the pioneer logic of the daily. And in, on page uh, 11... The first quote is from William Miller, <clears throat> and he says this. He, he, as he came to the daily in the book of Daniel, he didn't understand what it meant for, for certain, and William Miller's rule of study that has been verified by the spirit of prophecy is that when he came to a, something in the Bible which he did not understand, he would use his concordance to trace that, that word or thought through the Bible and find it everywhere he could in the Bible until he let the Bible identify what the word or phrase meant. And this is what he's describing when he came across the daily in the book of Daniel. He says, I read on and can find no other case in which it, the daily, was found but in Daniel. Now, brothers and sisters, that first sentence is very important to mark in your mind. The word translated as daily in the book of Daniel is continual. It's the Hebrew word continual. And you find it a hundred and some times in the Bible. Sometimes it pops into my mind what that is. I think it's maybe it's 199 times or 109 times. But it's used over and over again in the Bible. But William Miller, notice what he says. I read on and can find no other case in which it, the daily, was found but in Daniel. And this is an important understanding in the subject of the daily, daily in terms of the, the Hebrew text. Because everywhere else in the book of the, in the Bible that you find the word continual, it's used as an adjective. But in the book of Daniel, it's used as a noun. And, and Miller understood this. It, it may, you might find continual in other places in the scripture, but it, it's only used as it's used in Daniel in the book of Daniel. And that's what William Miller was saying. I read on and could find no other case in which it, the daily, was found but in Daniel. I then, by the aid of a concordance, took those words which stood in connection with it. Take away. He shall take away the daily from the time that the daily shall be taken away. That might seem a little bit repetitious, but what William Miller is doing there is he's taking the word take away, he's using it, and he's showing the reader that when he's searching to understand what the daily means, he says, There's all, every time you find the daily in the book of Daniel, it has the phrase take away in association with it, and he makes sure the reader understands that he's talking about the daily in chapter 8, chapter 11, and chapter 12. For him, the daily is the same symbol, the same meaning in everywhere it's found in the book of Daniel. And in Adventism today, you may not recognize it, but there are some, particularly those that attempt to reapply time prophecies at the end of the world in a day-for-a-day -day fashion, that teach the daily in chapter 12 of Daniel is different than the daily in chapter 11 and chapter 8. And William Miller, very specifically here, is saying, for me, for William Miller, the daily is the same symbol no matter where you find it in the book of Daniel. And it meant enough for him to make that point that he quoted 
the different phrases connected with daily in chapter 8, chapter 11, and chapter 12. I then, by aid of a concordance, took those words which stood in connection with it, take away, he shall take away the daily, from the time the daily be, shall be taken away. I read on and thought I would find no light on the text. Finally, I came to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. For the mystery of iniquity does already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed. And when I had come to that text, oh, how clear and glorious the truth appeared. There it is. That is the daily. Well, now, what does Paul mean by he who now letteth or hindereth? By the man of sin and the wicked, popery is meant. Well, what is it that hinders popery from being revealed? Why, it is paganism. Well, then, the daily must mean paganism. If you turn to 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 2, you can, see, you, you can read the passage where uh, William Miller's pointing us to. He's looking through the aid of a concordance, something that's taken away. Uh, because when it comes to the daily in the book of Daniel, it's, there's something about it that it's always taken away. He's trying to understand what the daily is. And everyone, everyone understands in the Christian world and the, the culture and time period of William Miller that the man of sin in chapter 2 of Thessalonians 2 is the papacy. All the Protestant world understood that then, even if they don't now. So when you come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Let's start with verse 3. Let no man deceive you. Now, what does that mean? Brothers and sisters, one of the, the emphasis that Paul's putting on this passage is that, hey, this is a subject you can be deceived about. This is a subject that there's going to be deception over. He doesn't just tell us about the man of sin and its relationship to paganism. He, he qualifies this passage by starting off saying, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, was yet with you, I told you these things. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, in the, the culture of William Miller, everyone knew this was the papacy. At the end of the world, we don't believe that anymore, most of us. Protestantism has went to sleep. We don't, you know, you go to a, a dictionary uh, before 1950, look up Scarlet Woman, it says very plainly, Scarlet Woman, the Roman Catholic Church, an allusion to Revelation 17. The Protestant world used to know who the Pope was in relation to Bible prophecy and the classic argument against or for the fact, establishing the fact that the papacy is the Antichrist, the Bible prophecy, is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So when William Miller's reading this, he understands who um, verses 3 and 4 are speaking about. But Paul, Paul mentions verses 3 and 4, and then what's he say? He says, remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. What Paul's doing here is he's about to write a subject, to the, a letter to the Thessalonians, and the letter is so explosive, it's so controversial, that Paul knows that if he sends that letter, and the, the authorities come across that, letters, that letter and read it, that they're going to use that letter to put him to death and put anyone that reads that letter to death. Because at that time period in earth's history, it was pagan Rome that was ruling the world. And what Paul is about to say is that there's going to come a point of time where pagan Rome is removed moved from the throne of the earth and papal Rome is going to take control of the earth. And for Paul to put in writing that, hey, pagan Rome is going to fall would have put himself and any Christian that had that letter in their position in jeopardy by the Roman authorities if they would find it. And he had preached that to him. He'd already stood in front of the Thessalonians and told them the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome. So when they're having this discussion about the second coming of Christ and Paul's going to write them a letter to try to clarify these things, he says, just remember, 
Remember that sermon I gave you when I was there about pagan Rome's relationship to papal Rome? He says, I'm not going to be point blank about this because I don't want to put you in jeopardy. And then he continues on. He says, Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now let, now you know that, now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The mystery of iniquity is the papacy. It was already active in Paul's day and age, but it wasn't sitting on the throne of the earth yet. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, and the Greek for letteth, is restraineth. And who is it that's restraining the mystery of iniquity? Who is it that's restraining the papacy from taking control of the world? It's pagan Rome. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Pagan Rome is going to be taken away. Paganism is going to be taken away. When, when William Miller seen this, he knew who the papacy was in this passage. Every Protestant knew who the papacy was in this passage. But he suddenly realized that Paul is saying, hey, there is a power in history that restrained the papacy from taking control of the world, and it continued to restrain the papacy from taking control of the world until it was taken away. And he realized it's the daily it's taken away in the book of Daniel just before the papacy is identified in the book of Daniel. Therefore, the daily must be paganism. It must be papal, pagan Rome. And that's his reasoning. And it's sound, brothers and sisters, it is sound. But let's continue on. For the mystery of iniquity, the papacy, doth already work. Only he who now letteth pagan Rome will continue to restrain the papacy until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8 and then shall that wicked be revealed with whom the Lord shall consume with the, bright, the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, what cause? And for this cause, what ca cause? And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe it lie. There's a cause here that brings about strong delusion to people who believe a lie. And what is the, the, the cause? It's that they do not love the truth. This is about the end of the world. When you, if you punch these verses into the writings of Ellen White, you'll find more often than not, by far, she applies this to Seventh-day Adventists. She is saying that... Seventh-day Adventists at the sun Sunday law time period are they going to receive the mark of the beast. They're going to receive strong delusion. The reason they're going to receive strong delusion is because they did not have a love of the truth. Of what truth? What truth? What truth is under discussion in the passage? The truth that's under discussion in the passage is not country living. The truth that's under discussion in the passage is not the health message. The truth that's under discussion in the passage is not the sanctuary. The truth that is under discussion in the passage is the relationship of paganism to papal Rome, the daily and the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel is the truth that Seventh-day Adventists will not love, and when they don't love it, this is the cause that brings them strong delusion at the Sunday law. Anyway, that's how William Miller received the logic of what the daily was. I don't have this one iota of thought that William Miller would have applied this to the strong delusion to God's people at the end of the world, but that's the point of this, of this study that we're doing here. We're saying that the truths that were the foundation of the Millerite movement, the foundation of the Adventism that had a present truth application then, they have an impact at the end of the world. And one of the things about the daily at the end of the world is it's a truth that has eternal consequences connected to how we receive it as Seventh-day Adventists. Now you notice the next quote in your notes from Josiah Litch. The daily sacrifice, we're talking about the daily here. The daily sacrifice is the present reading of the text. And if you turn to Daniel 8... Daniel 8, verse 11, it says, Yea, he magnified himself to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And verse 12 says, And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice, 
In verse 13 it says, in the middle of the verse, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? And if you turn to chapter 11, verse 31 of the book of Daniel, it says, an arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And then if you look at verse 11 of chapter 12, it says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, And Josiah Litch is addressing this subject of the word sacrifice. And brothers and sisters, if you have a King James Bible, you'll see everywhere we just read from the book of Daniel that the word sacrifice is in italics. And sometimes the Seventh-day Adventists, we don't understand any longer what that means. But when you see a word in the Bible that's italicized, it means that it's a word that was not in the original manuscripts that the Bible were translated from. It's a word that has been added there by the translators of the Bible. And generally, it adds a little bit of understanding and it's worth being there. But I ask you the question. You just thumb through your Bible. You open it random to anywhere in your King James Bible and you look down the page and you start counting how many um, italicized words there are. And there there must be hundreds of italicized words in the Bible. You know, some, I know people know. I don't know how many italicized words, but it's got to be in the hundreds. How many italicized words in God's word has inspiration taken the time to tell us that word doesn't belong there? Just one. We already read it in our last presentation. Sister White says the word sacrifice did not belong to the text. Out of all the hundreds of supplied words in the Bible, for some reason, God made sure he wanted us to understand that the one supplied word that is in God's word that does not belong there is the word sacrifice when it's used in connection with the word daily in the book of Daniel. And that's what Josiah Litch is saying here. The daily sacrifice is the present reading of the text, but no such thing as sacrifice is found in the original. This is acknowledged on all hands. It is a gloss or construction put upon it by the translators. The true reading is the daily and the transgression of desolation. Daily and transgression being connected together by and. The daily and the transgression of desolation. They are two desolating powers which were to desolate the sanctuary and the host. Brothers and sisters, that last sentence is a summary of one of the most important perspectives of the book of Daniel that the pioneers had. The pioneers understood that there are two desolating powers identified in the book of Daniel. And if if you don't take that perspective as you approach the prophecies in the book of Daniel, you miss one of the most important understandings in the book of Daniel, and the pioneers had it right. There are two desolating powers in the book of Daniel. And when you remove the word sacrifice from daily, where it's daily and transgression of desolation, then it's much easier to understand that it, those are two desolating powers. It's the daily desolating power and the transgression desolating power. In Daniel 8, in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12, it's the daily desolating power and the abomination desolating power. And in Daniel 11 and 12, the pioneers say the abomination that make it desolate is the papacy. And in Daniel 8, the pioneers say that the transgression of desolation is the papacy. And the transgression of desolation and the abomination of the desolation are both the papacy, according to the pioneers, and they were correct. But in those passages in Daniel 8, when it's the transgression of desolation, and Daniel 11 and 12, when it's the abomination of desolation, The transgression and the abomination, which are both identifying the papacy, are identifying two different aspects of the papacy. The transgression aspect of the papacy is emphasizing the combination of church and state. The abomination of desolation aspect of the papacy is identifying the the idolatrous aspect of the papacy. And if you put it in the terms of the book of Revelation... The idolatrous aspect of the papacy is Sunday worship, the mark of the beast. And in the book of Revelation, the church and state aspect of the papacy is the image of the beast. In the book of Revelation, it's the image of the beast and the mark of the beast that are paralleling the transgression of desolation and the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. But that's a little bit outside the scope, but it's in the record now. And the pioneers understood 
There are two desolating powers that run through the story of Daniel. Next quote, Apollos Hell, a church historian during that time, speaking of the word sanctuary. Um, if you turn to Daniel 8, verse 11, um, it says, <clears throat> He magnified himself to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, if you remember what A.G. Daniels in the last presentation was, he said he was asking Sister White questions about um, wh who the prince was and who the host was and the sanctuary. He was speaking about this verse. And in this verse, one of the components that makes all the difference in the world between the pioneer understanding and the modern theologians of Adventism understanding at the end of the world is this word sanctuary. And this word sanctuary, um, according to the pioneers, is a, is a pagan sanctuary. And sure enough, this word sanctuary in verse 11, it's mikdash. In the Hebrew, mikdash in the Bible can either be a pagan sanctuary or God's sanctuary. Whereas, in verse 13, only two verses later, in verse 13, it talks about sanctuary. In the very last phrase, it says to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And then verse 14 says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And in verses 13 and 14, you have the word sanctuary. And both of those verses, verses 13 and 14, the Hebrew word is kodesh. And it's used exclusively as God's sanctuary in the Bible, whether it's his God's sanctuary on earth or God's sanctuary in heaven. But in the Bible, when you see Kadesh, it can only be God's sanctuary, whereas Mikdash, the word translated as sanctuary in verse 11, it can be God's sanctuary, but it can also be a pagan sanctuary. In fact, without listening to the pioneers, without looking at anything other than that, brothers and sisters, for me, when you see a passage in Scripture, verse 11, 12, 13, and 14, there's no break in the flow there. This is, this is a passage in Scripture. Verse 11, 12, 13, and 14, and Daniel uses one Hebrew word that gets translated as sanctuary in verse 11 and a totally different Hebrew word that gets translated as sanctuary in verses 13 and 14 without knowing anything else. It tells you that Daniel is identifying two different sanctuaries. And since the Bible clearly tells us that verse 13 and 14, by the usage in the Bible, is only God's sanctuary, then it tells you by the difference that whatever this sanctuary is in verse, thir verse 11, it cannot be God's sanctuary. And that's just how the pioneers understood it. This is Apollos hell. What can be meant by sanctuary of paganism? Paganism and error of every kind have their sanctuary as well as truth. There are temples or asylums consecrated to their service. Some particular and renowned temple of paganism may then be supposed to be spoken of. Which of the numerous distinguished temples may it be? One of the most magnificent specimens of classic architecture is called the Pantheon. Its name signifies the temple or asylum of the gods. The place of its location is Rome. The idols of the nations conquered by the Romans were sacredly deposited in some niche or department of this temple and in many cases became objects of worship by the Romans themselves. Could we find a temple of paganism more strikingly? His sanctuary. The pioneers understood this sanctuary of verse 11 being the Pantheon temple which was located in the city of Rome. Pioneers were correct. Now, I mentioned this in our last presentation, this next quote, God's Helping Hand, from Publishing Ministry, page 356. It says, The grand instruction contained in Daniel and Revelation has been eagerly pursued by many in Australia. This book has been the means of bringing many precious souls to a knowledge of the truth. Everything that can be done should be done to circulate thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It is God's helping hand. Now, when it comes to Uriah Smith's book, Daniel and Revelation, how many other books can take the place of this? No other book. She just said so. It's God's helping hand. Of course, in that book, the pioneer position of the daily being paganism is upheld. And... Uh, you can see on page 12 a passage where um, Uriah Smith is articulating the, the pioneer position of the daily and, and, and nailing down the year 508 as the year that um, the daily was removed. 
and we should understand this. Now, brothers and sisters, let me put one thing on the board. Um, there is much to see, say about the pioneer understanding of the daily. Let me just put one thing in place here, and hopefully it will allow us to understand at least an argument on why we need to understand the daily correctly here at the end of the world. The pioneers believed, based on Daniel 7, you can see it up here on the 1843 chart, that the Roman Empire would disintegrate into ten kingdoms. And you can see them here. Here's the seven, and here's the three that had to be plucked up. The, the Huroli, the Ostrogoth, and the Vandals had to be removed by these seven European kings. That's what prophecy said, is that, that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that these seven kings were going to pluck up these three horns in order to place the little horn of the papacy. That's Daniel 7. But it's not simply in Daniel 7. The pioneer understanding of the removing of the daily is part of this history. In order for these seven European kings to come to the aid of the papacy to remove these three horns that were resisting the work of the papacy, these seven European kings had to cease to be pagans. Remember, pagan Rome disintegrates into ten kingdoms. And what are those kingdoms' religion? They're pagan. Ten pagan kingdoms. And three of these kingdoms, with their Aryan beliefs, are, they cannot coexist with the papacy. And the time period is coming when the papacy is about to be placed on the throne of the earth. These three horns, the Huroli, the Ostrogoth, and the Vandals need to be removed, but the papacy doesn't have any army of its own. But history says that one by one, these seven European kings come into a church-state relationship with the papacy, dedicating their military and economic support to placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. The first of these seven European kings was Clovis, king of France, in the year 496. And, and he came into a church-state relationship and began to be the military champion for the papacy. And one by one, each of these seven European kings did the very same thing until by the year 508, the last of these seven European kings, Arthur, king of England, came into a church-state relationship with the papacy. Now, if you go back into this history, and this is the history that the pioneers identify, when they, when they point out that, that Clovis and each of these kings, one by one, came into a church-state relationship with the papacy, they also point out that each one of those nations removed the legal profession of religion. They changed the legal profession of religion in their nations from paganism to Catholicism, so that by the year 508, all seven of these European kings were no longer pagan nations, they were Catholic nations. And in your, your syllabus here, you'll see a quote um, where Uriah Smith, out of the book which Sister White says is God's helping hand, is saying that by 508, the daily had been removed, and what is it that the, the pioneers understood the daily to represent? Paganism. So by the year 508, paganism was removed. So when you look at Bible prophecy as Seventh-day Adventists, we know the power at the end of the world that's going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. As Seventh-day Adventists, what's the power at the end of the world that places the papacy on the throne of the earth? The United States. So when you look at the history of the, the papacy, you realize that these seven European kings placed the papacy on the throne of the earth but at the end of the world, the United States places the papacy on the throne of the earth. So the pioneer, the foundational understanding of who and what these seven European kings are is essential if we're to understand what the United States is doing on planet earth today as it goes about its business of placing the papacy on the throne of the earth because it was all prefigured in the work of these seven European kings. So the foundational understanding of what paganism was, what the daily was, is essential to understand as we approach the Sunday law in the United States and the healing of the deadly wound. So in Matthew 24, 15, 
It says, when you, and this is Jesus speaking, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, <clears throat> I, I just ran by you very specifically and purposely the fact that in the book of Daniel, the transgression of desolation in Daniel 8 and the abomination that maketh desolate or the abomination of desolation in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12 that the pioneers of Adventism understood that the transgression and the abomination of desolation were what? The papacy, papal Rome, correct? That's the pioneer position. And they were correct. And in Matthew 24, Jesus says, he points to the book of Daniel, but he doesn't just point to the book of Daniel. He points to the subject of the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel, and then he emphasizes it and says, whoever reads this, you need to understand this. You need to understand the subject of the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. And the pioneers understood that the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel represented the papacy. Correct? So, how was this prophecy of Matthew 24, 15, and it was a prophecy, how was it fulfilled in history? As Seventh-day Adventists, we know this. In the first couple chapters of the Great Controversy, in 70 AD, pagan Rome came and placed the standards of its authority, its, its idolatrous standards, in the sacred precincts of the temple. And this was a sign to the Christians that the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 had been fulfilled. And what were they to do? They were to drop everything they were doing and flee from the city. And at the same time that that took place, that they placed the standards of their idolatry in the sacred precincts of the temple, they unexpectedly withdrew. And the Jews in the city thought, well, this is our opportunity to go out and attack the Romans as they're retreating. So as they chased the Romans, the Christians were given free space to come out of Jerusalem and get out of town because Rome came back in and totally wiped out Jerusalem. Is that correct? Is that how you understand the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation? Yes? Because we just, we, just did, we just identified two different things here. We just said the pioneers of Adventism said that the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel was the papacy, and we just identified that pagan Rome fulfilled the abomination of desolation. I mean, which is it? Because this is a subject that Jesus says, whosoever readeth, understand this one. Did pagan Rome fulfill the abomination of desolation? Or did papal Rome fulfill the abomination of desolation? Which is it? Are the pioneers right or wrong? Both. Both. And as I said just a couple minutes ago about um, Josiah Litch, the last statement on part one of this sermon, the last sentence of Josiah Litch says, there are two desolating powers which are des to desolate the sanctuary and the host. This is a theme in the book of Daniel that was foundational to the pioneer understanding of the books of Daniel and Revelation. And they base it on... Daniel 9.26, if you turn there, in Daniel 9.26, Daniel 9.26 says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. What is this? What is this? What's being told to Daniel here? Gabriel's telling Daniel what? He's telling him the historical breakdown of the 2300-day prophecy. This is the very foundation of Adventism. In, in verse 26 is one of the components of the historical fulfillment of the history of the 2300 years of Daniel 8:14. And in verse 26, it says, And after three score and two, two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, crucifixion of Christ, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who, who is the prince that shall come? You'll see in your notes the, the curse of Moses. On the bottom of page 12, you have Daniel 9, 11 through 13, and there, it's twice in Daniel's prayer. You know, we were in Tacoma here recently, and we were just approaching this subject, and right as we were getting ready to approach it, a, a brother brought up, you know, as we always do in Adventism, and correctly so. I'm not trying to belittle or undercut anything the brother was saying, but he says, you know, the the prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 is one of the most important prayers in the Bible because it indicates that no matter what kind of apostasy may or may not be going on in God's church, when it comes to praying for God's church, we have to associate ourselves with, 
with God's church and confess our sins as if we are, you know, corporately uh, connected with God's church. And when it comes to Daniel's prayer in chapter 9, on that theme, it's one of the best examples of that truth, but there is more in that prayer than we usually look at. And one of the things that's in that prayer is in verse 11 through 13 of Daniel 9. As Daniel's praying this prayer, conf confessing the condition of God's people, in verse 11 it says, Yea, all Israel has transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. There's been a curse poured upon Israel, according to Daniel, that he's recognizing as he's, as he's praying and fasting. And the curse that's been poured upon them is in fulfillment to the, the writings of Moses. And you look at verse 13, he continues on. He says, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. So when we get back, if we pull out of there and we go to verse 26, where we were just reading, it says, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. The city that's going to get destroyed in the time frame that Christ was crucified is what city? Jerusalem. And there's a prince that's going to come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And who's that prince represent? Pagan Rome. And sure enough, on your next page, you'll see a passage from Deuteronomy 28. It's one of the places where you find the blessings and curses promised against Israel for their obedience or disobedience. This is part of the blessing and cursing that Daniel was acknowledging in verses 11 through 12. The curses come upon us in fulfillment of Moses' curses, and this is one of them, and you will find Notice in verse 15, the first part of this quote, that uh, it starts with the blessings, but then in, in the second paragraph, it goes, gets to verse 45. And at the end of the first paragraph, I'm on page 13 under Deuteronomy 28, the second full paragraph, one of the components of the curse, if Israel would break the covenant, you'll see in the the last sentence, it says, Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. Who's the iron kingdom? Rome. Rome is very specifically identified in the curse of Moses as the nation that will bring punishment on Israel if they were disobedient to the covenant. The truth is, if they would have been faithful to the covenant, this prophecy would have never been fulfilled. But it was fulfilled, and it was going to be a country that was associated with iron. And notice the next paragraph. It says, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as an eagle flieth. One of the symbols of Rome is the eagle. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Uh, the Italian language is a different type of language than is spoken in the Middle East. Um, a nation of fierce countenance. One of the characteristics of Roman Bible prophecy is this fierce countenance. And then if you drop down in the middle where it's still bold face, it says, until he, pagan Rome, hath destroyed thee, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all the land. And certainly we know about the siege of Jerusalem. In Daniel 8, you see it right underneath there, you'll see one of, the, one of the expressions identifying pagan Rome as a fulfillment of the curse of Moses in Daniel 8 when it says, and in the t latter time of their kingdom, in the latter time of the Greek kingdom, the third kingdom of Bible prophecy, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. At the end of the time period of Greece and in the latter time of their kingdom, when transgressors are come to a full, a king of fierce countenance. This is what Moses promised in Deuteronomy 28. Um, you, uh, top of the, the next paragraph before that, it says a nation of fierce countenance. In Daniel 8, it says a king of, first, of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences. This is an expression of speaking another language. Uh, 
the few times I've been in Korea, and, and they don't speak much English in Korea, and you're standing, for me, when I'm standing around listening to a group of Koreans speak, it's a dark language. I don't understand any of it. And that's what's being identified here. The king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and destroy the mighty and holy people. And at the last phrase, he shall stand up against the prince of princes. Who stood up against Christ? Pagan Rome. Pagan Rome attempted to kill him at his birth. Pagan Rome participated in putting him on the cross. They stood up to him. Pagan Rome is the fulfillment of the prediction of the curse against Israel that Moses set forth. So when you, you come to Daniel 9 and you see Daniel praying about the condition of God's people and, its, and God's sanctuary in the city of Jerusalem, and Daniel references, I realize that the curse of Moses has come upon us. And then the Gabriel comes in fulfillment of that prayer, in answer to that prayer in chapter 9, and he says, okay, Daniel, now I'm going to have you... Um, understand the matter and consider the vision. And he begins to give the historical breakdown of the 2300 years prophecy. And he gets to verse 26, where we were working on. And it says, The prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is a primary fulfillment of the curse of Moses, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But the pioneers tell us that it is verse 26 that Jesus was speaking about in Matthew 24. The pioneers understood that the abomination of desolation in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12, it's, it's not called the abomination of desolation in Daniel 11:31 or Daniel 12:11. It's called the abomination that maketh desolate. But that is the abomination of desolation. And the pioneers tell us that the abomination that maketh desolate in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12 is the papacy but that when Jesus was talking about when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let he who readeth understand that what Jesus was speaking about is Daniel 9.26. This is, this is their argument. Because in Daniel 9.26, they say it's identifying two desolating powers. Notice verse 26. It says, The prince, pagan Rome, that shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, eighty seventy. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Desolations in the plural. The pioneers say this word desolations is saying there are two desolating powers that fall under the category of the abomination of desolation. The first is the daily paganism. The second, the abomination that maketh desolate or the transgression of desolation, the papacy. But brothers and sisters, the verse teaches that too. The verse teaches that. Because it says, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 12. And you can find this on, on verse 14 of your syllabus if you want to. In, verse, in, cha in page 14 of your syllabus, in the center of the page, it says, Revelation 12, two desolations. And it starts with Revelation 12, 5. And it says, And she brought forth a man-child. And we understand the Seventh-day Adventists that this is identifying the birth of Christ, born into Christ's church. She, being Christ's church, brings forth the man-child that's going to rule the world with a rod of iron. That's Jesus Christ. And her child, Jesus Christ, was caught up unto God and to his throne. And when did Jesus ascend to the throne? 34 A.D. So verse 5 here in Revelation 12 is talking about the time period when Christ was on earth and ultimately ascended to heaven. And who was the historical power at that time that was opposing God and his people? Pagan Rome. This is pagan Rome. And then notice what the next, very next verse says, verse 6. And the woman, and as Adventists we understand this is the church, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And what's this thousand two hundred and three score days? The twelve hundred and sixty years of papal rule, right? So verse five is talking about pagan Rome and its persecuting actions. And verse six goes right into papal Rome and its persecuting actions, correct? 
And then if you drop down to verse 14 in Revelation 12, it says, and to similar verse to verse 6, it says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, a times, and a half a time from the face of the serpents. Once again, the dark ages. But notice the next verse. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after a woman. A flood. The... the the persecution of the papacy during the 1,260 years here in the book of Revelation, it is symbolized by a flood. So if you go back to Daniel 9.26, that's exactly what it says. Daniel 9.26 says, The people of the prince that shall come, pagan Rome, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary in, in AD 70, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And under the end of the war, desolations are determined. The destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 wasn't the end of the war. There was more coming in the flood of the 1260 years. There are desolations determined, two desolations. Pagan Rome destroys the city in AD 70, and then the desolation of the flood of the 1260 years of the Dark Ages. The pioneers were right. When Jesus was saying, understand the abomination of desolation, he was, he was describing both of these desolating powers under one, one category, the abomination that maketh desolate. But brothers and sisters, the pioneers had it right. There are two desolating powers in the book of Daniel. Look at Daniel 9.27. And I'm, a, I'm on the bottom of page 14 now. I, I've, I worked through some quotes there that I didn't point you to as we went through the notes. But after uh, verse 26 and 27 of Daniel 9 need to be considered together. Verse 26, it's emphasizing that there is a war, uh, and the war encompasses two desolating powers. The first is the desolating power that ultimately destroys Jerusalem in AD 70, and the second is the papacy that's symbolized by a flood in both the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation that persecuted God's people for 1260 years. And then verse 27 says, And he, Christ, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And if you have a marginal reference for this last word, desolate, it means desolator. But this last phrase is saying in verse 27, if you've ever wondered about, you know what, what I used to wonder up until just recently, you know, I've been an Adventist for 20-some years, and I would read this verse, and I, I, it just seemed awkward. I didn't quite understand what it was saying. I, and there, I'm sure there's still much in this verse that I do not understand, but some things I understand better now. In the last part of this verse, it says, Even until the consummation, and that determined, shall be poured upon the desolator. The consummation of what? talking about because of the overspreading of abominations that it's going to be made desolate. When you're looking at, at verses 26 and 27 together, then you realize that there, there's two themes that are in both these verses and they should be studied together. The first is the, the conclusion of the covenant with ancient Israel. When Christ is finishing uh, his work for them at the cross. He's bringing to a conclusion, getting ready to divorce them as his people. And at the same time, both of these verses are describing the two desolating powers that are going to be used by the Lord to punish Israel for breaking the covenant and even continue to persecute during the Dark Ages. So when we get to verse 27, and it says, unto the consummation, it's talking about until the, the end, the conclusion. The conclusion of what? The conclusion of the war. And when's the conclusion of the war of verse 26? Well, the, the war of verse 26 ends with the flood. And chapter 12, verses 6, 14 tells us the flood was for 1,260 years. So when is the, the conclusion or the consummation of the flood? It's 1798. 1798, it's talking about here. And you can see that. It's, you may right, right now be saying, well, maybe that's so, maybe it's not. No, it's crystal clear. We're going to show it to you in a minute. Because it says, that determined shall be poured upon the desolator. One of the desolators was papal Rome, and it's saying very specifically, at the consummation, at the conclusion of the war, there is something determined 
for the desolator. And at the conclusion of the war, the desolator is the papacy. It's paganism at the beginning. At the end, it's the papacy. And there's something determined for the papacy. Now, if you go to Daniel 11, verse 36, which, brothers and sisters, verse 36 of Daniel 11, many Bible commentators, and I believe they are 100% right when they take this position, they say that verse 36 of Daniel 11 is the verse that Paul uses to express 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he's dealing with the man of sin sitting in a temple of God showing himself that he is God. Commentators will say the, the, the characteristics of verse 36 are what Paul uses to identify the papacy. And verse 36 of Daniel 11 says, and the king, and this is the papacy, the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, setting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is, this is the logic between this verse and 2 Thessalonians. It says, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till when? Till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. There's something determined for the papacy when the indignation is accomplished. And we've already looked at what's determined for the papacy in verse 27 of 9. Chapter 9, it says, Even until the consummation and that determined, that determined, the word determined, shall be poured upon the desolator. And what these two verses are saying is that in 1798, the deadly wound was going to be delivered to the papacy. There was desolation going to be brought upon the papacy. And the way that you understand that, brothers and sisters, is in this phrase, he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. What is the indignation? Brothers and sisters, where we're moving for, we're, going to, we're just pointing it forward to you at this time. I'm not going to nail it down. Is the indignation is the 2,520 years. That's how the pioneers understood it. God's, William Miller believed that God's indignation would last for 2,520 years and that it began on Judah. The indignation began to be carried out on Judah in the year 677. And if you add 2,520 years to that, you come to 1844. The chart says 1843. But remember, William Miller missed the year zero. So if you correct William Miller's mistake, if you begin the 2,520 years of God's indignation against Judah, it comes to a conclusion in 1844. But in 1850... Hiram Edson reinvestigated the 2520, and he says, William Miller, not so. That if you're going to start the God's, God's indignation against Israel, you need to start when it first took place, and it first took place in the year 723 when the northern kingdom of Israel and Samaria was carried into captivity by the Assyrians. And if you start God's indignation, as Hiram Edson does in 1850, in the year 723 B.C., now think about this, brothers and sisters. And I know you may not have heard anything at all about the 2520, and we're going to deal with this more as we go on. But if you take 2,520 years and you assign it as the pioneers do as being God's indignation, and you add 2,520 years to the year 723, where do you come to? You come to 1798. And so when you go to verse 36, and it says the papacy shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. The indignation was accomplished according to Hiram Edson in 1798. And that that is determined shall be done. And what is determined? Well, you go back to verse 27 of chapter 9, and it tells you what's determined. It says that desolation will be poured upon the desolator at the end of the war, in 1798, when the indignation is accomplished, and brothers and sisters, you know what the pioneers say? The pioneers say the, the tool the Lord used to bring the indignation came in two parts. There was two desolations, two desolators. That was one of the primary foundational themes to the pioneers. And notice this. If you start the 2,520-year time prophecy, which is here illustrated on the pioneer chart that Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord. If you started in the year 723, as Hiram Edson nailed it down in 1850, you know what happens? Well, if you divide 2520 by 2, 
you come to 1260. And if you start in 723 and you go halfway through, you know where you come to? The year 538. And you realize that when the pioneers said there were two desolating towers, that paganism was used to bring God's indignation against Israel for 1260 years, ending in 538. And then the flood, the abomination of desolation, the papacy brought indignation against his people for another 1260 years. And if you think it's an accident that the 2520 can be divided in two in agreement with the fact that the pioneers understood there was two desolating powers in the book of Daniel that would be used against God's people and that the, the division of two takes place in 538, then you're not familiar with God's word because there are no accidents in God's word. There just isn't. Um, anyway, we have, we have more to say about the 2520 as we get closer to looking at the 1843 chart. But uh, it's good to do a little bit of preview before we get to that point. Um, time appointed. We have a little bit more to say about um, time appointed in, in this study, but we're not quite um, there. Uh, Let me just refer you to your appendix. When it comes to the daily, and that's where we're at right now, in this particular sermon you have an appendix, which is this study of, uh, that was put together by the editors of the Review and Herald. At that time, I believe one of the editors, it was a group of men, one of the editors was most likely Uriah Smith, and another one was most likely James White. So you have two men there that put together their presentation of their understanding of the daily, which was in agreement with the understanding of the Millerites many years prior, and uh, will continue to use the foundational understanding of the daily as we progress through this, this study. Let me make sure I closed everything off that I want to say. And uh, in our next presentation, we will, we will look at some of the words, Hebrew words, in the book of Daniel that make a, a defense for the pioneer position of the daily. Now, I have a couple minutes. Let me put this on the tape. Hiram Edson was asked if he could ask if he would send in some articles to put in the Review and Herald magazine, the beginning of the Review and Herald magazine. He was asked to do so by James White, who was the editor. And he put together a study where he went to the 1843 chart and he said, William Miller was wrong. William Miller, when he took the 2520 and started in 677 and ended in 1843, he says, now that it's all, that history's passed, 1843 and 1844 is passed, there's no logical historical fulfillment in 1843. That's Edson's argument. So he goes back to the, the carrying away of the northern kingdom in 723 and sees God's indignation for 2,520 years carried out in this history. He says, William Miller is wrong. What, what we've concluded here recently is that William Miller wasn't wrong. Is that when you start the 2520 in the same year that William Miller did, and you go forward, you come to 1844. Remember, William Miller was wrong about the year zero. And suddenly, you realize that the 2520 year time period of God's indignation against the northern kingdom was one prophecy that ended in 1798, and the 2,520 years of indignation against the southern kingdom that began in 677, it came to a conclusion in 1844, and that there are two aspects of this prophecy, and these two aspects tie the book of Daniel together into a neat little package. And we have much more to say about that as we proceed, but we'll close with prayer at this point. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we look back on the, the logic that was employed by the, the men you raised up in the foundations of Adventism, it's amazing to see that in that ancient time where they didn't have computers and CD-ROMs and easy access to libraries, 
that these men could come to such clear and sound and strong understandings. It's, an, it's humbling to realize that it only could have been through your participation that they arrived at these truths. And yet here we are at the end of the world and we, we no longer seem to understand what the truths are or believe that these positions are sound and strong. Forgiveness for, forgive us for our wandering in the wilderness of Laodicea and we ask that you would acquaint us once again with the foundations of this movement um, because it's only those of us that will see the foundations that could possibly understand the, the new things that you have for God's people here as you prepare to raise up the 144,000. And we ask to be a part of that number and that you accomplish this work in each and every one that's um, listening to this presentation is our prayer in Jesus' name.